Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian here in Nashville, Tennessee, covering the Army Aviation Association of America's annual conference and trade show, the number one gathering of U.S. Army aviators from around the world, gathering here to talk technology, budget, strategy, and more with their industry counterparts, uh, uh, fellow service members, international, as well as media. Our coverage here is sponsored by Bell and Leonardo DRS. And we're here on the Bell stand to talk to Keith Flail, who is the Vice President uh, for Advanced Tilt Rotor Systems uh, at Bell. Uh, you got the V280 uh, in your uh, portfolio, which is uh, going uh, very, very well. You have the V247 uh, also that's in your portfolio, although we're not going to be uh, talking uh, uh, about that. Full disclosure, Bell also sponsors uh, the weekly uh, Defense and Aerospace uh, Report uh, podcast. So Keith, uh, give us a little bit of a, um, a, a sense on uh, how you guys make that 2028 target. So we heard the Vice Chief of uh, the Army, General McConville, uh, today, who's going to be the future Chief of Staff of the United States Army, very, very clearly say the four customers for this airplane, and he wants IOC on it, 101st, uh, 160th Aviation Regiment, the Special Operations, Special Operations Command, uh, as well as the National Guard to have this uh, capability by 2028. So, you know, you guys have had, a, you know, over the last year, a very successful flight test program. But how do you make that, you know, in the, in the event that you're success, uh, successful in winning the Cape Set 3 contract, mm -hmm. walk us through the schedule and how you guys are going to be able to deliver an airplane in 2028 because that is a very, very aggressive target that's only nine years away. Yeah, so I think the, uh, the opportunity here is since we've been on this joint multi-role journey with as a United States government industry partnership, so it's been over six years now, reducing risk and informing requirements for the future long-range assault aircraft. So we're in an incredible position right now, arguably in the best position ever for a rotorcraft type of program in terms of uh, what's been done and what's accompl been accomplished under this uh, science and technology effort. So because of the risk we've been able to burn down and how much more we know about this capability and the proof that we've been able to bring. So now, uh, well over a year in the flight test with the uh, achievements that we've had, getting over 300 knots of airspeed, proving out the low speed and the high speed agility, uh, over 100 you know, uh, flight hours of test, and really ringing out the, the, the early stages of uh, reliability and maintainability on the aircraft. We know so much more. So the, the, the position to launch the program of record, uh, we are in a, in a very, very good spot. So when you look at you know, 2028, it's 2019 right now, being able to get into an accelerated acquisition, uh, prove out the remaining capabilities and, and shore up things in the design that are not on the one that's flying right now, and get ourselves uh, to a limited user test and all the testing that's required and get initial key personnel training, all the things on that road to get a first unit equipped by 2028, we believe it is absolutely achievable because of everything that we've been able to do. Because the reality is, is uh, between industry and government overall in this joint multi-role effort, you have a billion dollar investment over six plus years so you're, you're, you have a six year head start on this entire thing. So 2028, it may seem a little bit intimidating, but it's really not when you look how far we've come since we began this program together. Um, that's certainly going to be something that's going to be interesting to watch given that Cape Set 01 now is a priority and they're setting a very, very ambitious target of only roughly 42 months ahead. So it's going to be, that's going to be very, very interesting. At least you guys have this behind you and airplanes uh, are, are already flying, right? Whether it's, it's you guys or the Boeing Defiant guys or uh, uh, on that. Um, Let's talk a little bit about uh, the cost. Uh, $43 million is the target price. That's one of the KPPs on the program. Uh, this is a lot of airplane uh, for $43 million. Talk to us a little bit about whether or not you guys are going to make that target, and if so, how. Okay, the, the government, the Army just put out the uh, future uh, long-range assault aircraft, the request for information. Uh, within that, it had an Army section, it had a United States Marine Corps section, as well as a Special Operations Command section. Uh, as we looked at that, uh, that RFI and turned that response in one week, so it was really, I think it was great to see that the government is moving at such a quick pace uh, for, for this program. Uh, so with that RFI response, uh, within there, as you, as you mentioned to me, the, they put a uh, $43 million average uh, union, Average unit manufacturing cost was the target. Uh, we absolutely are, are below the $43 million mark with this capability. Understanding at the same time, there is still some ambiguity in the requirements. That's why they put the RFI out so that we could comment on uh, the different uh, performance attributes that they're looking for feedback on. But I, it, it was very encouraging to me to see how it showed up in terms of a requirement, a threshold, and an objective um, um, kind of setting the goalposts for what they need and being able to provide that feedback so when they go to put out the draft uh, request for proposal, you know, we'll see the, the next round of this. So this, this iterative uh, process with industry I think is really valuable so they can set the, the requirements uh, in terms of the, uh, the art of the achievable, which helps get at that uh, first unit equipped and that army of 2028 capability that we talked about before. 
Um, I, I, in the RFI, was there, uh, and I apologize for not having taken a look at it uh, in advance, but was there enough commonality among all of these types? Because historically, you know, when you look at the Marine Corps aircraft, the Marine Corps has a whole bunch of very, very unique and separate requirements, Special Operations Command layers their own things on, and sometimes everybody wants to be different for the sake of being different, as opposed to saying, look, how, wh what do we really need in terms of the commonality of this program? Is there enough commonality there? And are the differences something that have been purposefully minimized to actually help you execute a very complicated program quickly? That's a great question. So I think what's been uh, um, really great from my perspective is watching the, the services, the Army, the Marine Corps, and Special Operations Command as they work through the analysis of alternatives process and looking at the trades and the commonality. So what degree of commonality can you achieve with these unique requirements? So the Army section of the RFI laid out their base requirements. Our understanding is currently the acquisition strategy looks like an Army lead and then followed by the Marine Corps and Special Operations Command. Then they laid out the uh, United States Marine Corps unique requirements and then the Special Operations Command unique requirements. So we're able to comment uh, with the requirements and you really look at kind of a compliance matrix with these thresholds and these objectives that they laid out in terms of what they're looking at for speed and range and payload. And we, we went through and we color coded like blue where we exceeded the requirement, green where we got where we complied with the requirement, and then some yellows we highlighted, just as challenges to let them know that you know if you turn this knob on the on your mission profile and you do this maneuver as hover in ground effect as opposed to hover out of ground effect when you start the mission, you may be able to you know save some money and drive greater commonality between the platforms. So that's a lot of uh, the goodness in the process with this RFI is we were able to comment and give them uh, some some good feedback. For, for consideration as they lay out the requirements to maximize that commonality you talked about between the platforms so you don't have you know, extremely unique configurations between the three and make them as common as, as possible while still meeting all of their requirements. Um, everybody uh, acknowledges the attributes of tilt rotor. I mean, I remember when the U.S. Army was considering it when the Marine Corps was bringing them on in the early 90s. Um, there were those in the Army who were saying, look, it's really great, but the cost per flying hour is going to kill us. That perception still persists, even though the V-22 has proven uh, its doubters wrong. It's a combat-capable platform. It works fi fine. It has quite a lot of agility, even though people talk about the agility part of it. I think you guys work with a lot more control authority uh, in terms of the, the flapping you guys can put in there to get that kind of... Uh, uh, agility into the system. Talk to us about what you're demonstrating in terms of what your real cost per flying hour is, because co cost per flying hours and maintainability and reliability figures, because the Army has made that abundantly clear that we actually want as much capability as we can for the lowest cost per flying hour as we possibly can as well, and the greatest and easy, e easiest sustainability in the field. Right, and that's a great question. So when you talk about cost per flight hour and you're talking about a tilt rotor, you really, you have to look at it very, very differently compared to a typical edgewise rotor craft. So one of the things is when you talk about cost per flight hour, what are you accomplishing within that hour? So that the, you really have to look at this difference. So the Marine Corps has looked a lot with tilt rotor at cost per seat mile, cost per pound per mile. And when you look at those kind of things, we absolutely uh, are the best thing out there that you can get because you get the best of a helicopter and you get the best of an airplane. You're able to ride on the wing. When you get into cruise mode, you're able to slow the rotors down and you sip gas. So that's how you get that incredible uh, range on the aircraft. And then the speed you get out of a tilt rotor, you know, twice the speed, twice the range. And what that means in terms of cost of operations when you're able to um, have that kind of operational productivity across uh, across the battlefield. So you really have to look at costs a little bit different when you talk about this from, from an operational productivity standpoint and not just measure the typical cost per flight hour. To make it even a little more complex, we've had some engagements here today, when you talk about cost per flight hour, the way the Air Force does it, the way the Marine Corps does it, the way the Army does it, they, they compute them differently. So when folks throw those numbers around, you really have to get in and you have to dissect those numbers to understand what are you getting out of the asset per hour when you look at what it's doing. Um, look at Afghanistan as an example. You could execute missions in Afghanistan with tilt rotor platforms with one forward operating base in the center of the nation, as opposed to all of the assembly areas you have to have that are, that are like that because of the range limitations of helicopters. So every time you put an aviation unit on the ground, you got to put the force protection in place, you got to put the forward arming and refueling points in place. So you really have to, you have to back up on this cost question and really look at what does it mean in terms of the speed and range and what that does for combat operations for the ground maneuver commander. Um, and but as uh, that's absolutely the case, and we should say the Navy, right, decided to go 
to the V-22 as its future carrier onboard delivery capability to replace the C-2 Greyhound, which was a conventional airplane, in order to have not the hub and spoke system now where the COD flies cargo over to the carrier and then you helicopter it out, but that actually V-22 can go to the big deck amphibs and all the other ships in a formation as well. But talk to us a little bit about what you're demonstrating in terms of your cost per flying hour on this system, given that you guys put an enormous amount of investment in to learn from the lessons of the V-22 to try to take as much operating cost and ease that maintenance uh, and also ease manufacture as well, right? I mean, you guys don't have dihedral in the way. There's a whole bunch of things that you guys did on that. So talk to us a little bit about what you're demonstrating in terms of what your cost per flying hour is and how that's significantly, you know, how, how much less is it, for example, than a V-22 comparably? That's a great question. So the one thing about whenever uh, the government goes to measure you know, uh, mission reliability or availability. When you're a new system, it becomes a proof campaign. So the, the, the challenge there is you want a certain level of availability and reliability, but you have to go and execute and accumulate enough data to know that you're actually meeting your targets or exceeding your targets to get to the numbers that you're looking at for those maintenance-free operating periods. What we've seen with the V280 and the 100 plus flight hours of um, um, flight tests and envelope expansion we've had so far is very, very good indications in terms of uh, the, the, the big hitters for operations and support costs. When you look at rotorcraft, it's gearboxes and blades. Those are the things that, that impact you the most. So far, uh, on our blades and our gearboxes, we've seen incredible performance. A lot of that is uh, due to the, the, some of the new design techniques that we have put into place, uh, some of our offboard testing that we've done before getting to the aircraft. And when you look at the, the B-22, as you mentioned, uh, currently on the B-22, about 60% of the maintenance occurs in the nacelle areas, which would make sense because that's where all the dynamic components are and the magic of tilt rotor is. So knowing that, we really focused on the maintainability and the accessibility within those nacelles of how we laid things out, the configurations, really thinking about uh, line replaceable units, how are we going to do this, how are you going to access the engine, how are you going to get it a gearbox. So a lot of the things in terms of how we designed and built uh, the V280 really, really focused with the design for maintainability as well as the initial design for manufacturing. First of all, you want to fundamentally build it cheaper, and then once you have it in the inventory, what are you going to do to maintain it? So there's the, the physical layout of the aircraft and how you get at things. Um, the improved reliability because we have so much more knowledge because we get to stand on the shoulders of V-22 and we have all of those flight hours, 450,000 plus flight hours, all those lessons learned, applying that into a clean sheet design and now we can really optimize tilt rotor uh, for this next uh, cycle of learning. Uh, so so it's, it's a combination of all those things that we're talking about, easing the maintainability, uh, driving in greater inherent reliability into the components that you have, and, and then you couple that with the digital thread. This entire aircraft being designed in the digital thread, so all of everything matches, so the, the, the precision of the parts when you go to build the aircraft, um, the environment that you have, that the government and industry can be together, your training publications, uh, training your pilots, training your maintainers, you, everything leverages that one central data source and you're able to do it in a, in a 3D environment. So you're, you're enhancing every knob that you can turn that's related to sustainability. We've, we've attacked every single one of those to um, provide the best uh, affordable and sustainable package that we can for the warfighter while still delivering that revolutionary uh, leap in capability. Keith Flail, the Vice President for Advanced uh, Future Vertical Lift uh, Systems here at Bell. Uh, thanks very much, best of luck on the program, and uh, hopefully we're going to see you down in uh, sunny Texas and, and actually uh, get to touch uh, and Absolutely. smell the airplane uh, in, in, uh, in the aluminum. That's right, come see us anytime. All right, thanks so much, Vago. Thank you.